Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Negotiation, where we speak with Kevin Hui, a serial entrepreneur and marketer who has worked across the sports, film, education, and capital markets industries and is now the president of Can Life Sports, a company that has spent a decade developing and growing ice hockey in China. We talk about the physical infrastructure needs, aka more ice rinks, obviously necessary to grow the game in China, how Can Life works to let Chinese youth experience the hockey culture, why the growth of the game has focused on China recently, and how well China's hockey team will do in its first ever Olympic tournament next year in Beijing. Enjoy. That overly competitive culture, truth is, is not just in hockey. You know, you'll see it here in the schooling, the school system as well, too. That competition level is traumatizing. It develops their competitive edge, you know, as an adult, whether they go into the workforce or in business. But at the same time, it takes that fun personality out of them. And so, you know, so the idea is we're not just educating kids in the culture. We're educating parents as well, too. Home to over 4 billion people, the Asia-Pacific region boasts one of the most powerful consumer markets on the planet. Not only is it home to half the world's under 30 population, but it's also home to more than half the world's internet users. It's a market no globally minded brand should ignore, but entering markets like China is no easy task. Just ask the likes of Microsoft, Google, Uber, and Facebook. Times are changing, and with the right partners, doors are slowly opening as more and more companies find success expanding into the markets of the Middle Kingdom. I myself spent eight years in China, mostly as a venture capitalist, helping early stage tech companies enter the Asia Pacific market successfully. This show is dedicated to uncovering and examining successful China entry and growth strategies by interviewing the people behind those success stories. My name is Todd Embley, and welcome to The Negotiation, brought to you by WPIC Marketing and Technologies. Kevin, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on today. No problem. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. So let's start with a quick introduction into who you are and what you're doing over in China. Born in Toronto, then later in high school, moved to the Vancouver area. And so after college, um, I decided that I wanted something new, something different. Uh, so my parents are originally uh, from Hong Kong, immigrants from Hong Kong. I wanted to just explore the Asian culture, the Chinese culture, in a one-week decision. You know, meaning I decided that hey, all of a sudden I just I, sh- I think I should go to China, on to Beijing, China, uh, a week later, and haven't looked back ever since. And why why Beijing? Well. When I, when I was coming to China, I had a choice between Beijing or Shanghai because I had friends on, in, in both, both cities. But I figured if I was going to go to China, I may as well go somewhere and really experience the culture. And during that time, Shanghai was already like a very developed cosmopolitan city. You know, and I thought, okay, I can go anywhere for that. Um, and Beijing at that time, they didn't have as many skyscrapers. Um, they had a lot of those little old alleyways. We call them hutongs over here. and you know, it just had a lot of character to it. And I, I wanted to fully experience that. And, and the other thing is, too, I spoke a lot less English in, in Beijing. And one of the reasons I wanted to come was to, to learn Mandarin Chinese. And that really helped because there were so many instances where I was forced to remember a certain Chinese word or a Chinese phrase that, that was used because nobody, wherever I was, spoke English. Cantonese typically comes from southern China and, you know, and, and of course, Hong Kong, yeah. uh, whereas uh, Mandarin uh, is is kind of everything north. Right. Am I getting that about right? Yeah, ex- exactly. Uh, so Cantonese, I mean, Cantonese is primarily Guangzhou, Guang, like the Guangdong province and in Hong Kong. And actually, every province, every city has a different dialect. There are thousands of tens of thousands of different dialects across China. Cantonese was popularized because of the, uh, that was where the trade uh, was mainly focused on uh, in the old days and then the immigration um, and then the Hong Kong immigration. And so Cantonese was the most popular of the dialects uh, outside of the main Mandarin. And Mandarin actually doesn't belong to any any specific city or, or town or anything like that. It, it was um, created to standardize the language uh, throughout China. And so unless you're from, uh, e- even in Beijing, even in Beijing, the capital where Mandarin is the official language, they have their own dialect, which is similar to Mandarin, but a little, a little, I guess, bold, like bolder in pronunciation. And, and they have their own slangs and, uh, mm-hmm. and terms that they use. Are you a uh, Fu Yan or a Fu Yar? I'm a, uh, it depends, it depends, uh, 
It depends on which, which, which number of beverage I'm on. <laughs> yeah, and how quickly you need it. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about, you know, Can Life Sports. You know, this is this is your, your main gig. This is what you're working on. Uh, maybe a little bit about uh, Can Life Sports' mission, what you guys are up to, and, uh, you know, what does the day-to-day look like for Can Life? Can Life Sports is a uh, – we primarily focus on the development and the growth of hockey in China. Now, so Can Life Sports was started back in uh, 2011 by its founder, Curtis Drack. And I actually only joined Can Life just middle of last year. So Can Life has always been a – uh, an organizer of events, trading programs, and everything to do with hockey. And then for a time, founder got involved with the, the NHL and did a lot, a lot of work with them. So a lot of that uh, can life stuff was, was still ongoing, but the founder was kind of combining the two efforts um, just because it's, it's the same kind of mission. Then when he stopped with the NHL, the, uh, the pandemic hit. And so it took about a one year pause. And when, uh, when, when, when Kurt came back to, to China, he, he wanted to go full time again, and that's when we started talking because because we had kind of worked together on on some projects in the past couple of years, and then like, realizing that this is the Olympics that's coming right now, and there's a huge push for hockey, and so he really wanted to go all in to promote the sport grow the company and really focus on the long term. And that was at the same time that I was having a small transition in my career as well, too. Though I was helping the hockey community in a recreational way, I fully transitioned into a full time, let's grow the game, grow hockey type of type of role. So, you know, so right now, starting from last year with the pandemic here in, in Beijing or in China, Beijing started to come down a bit. And we were looking at dates uh, when we when we thought that things that events can start happening again and, and people can start gathering again and and so and we started planning um different events so uh you know we can get a little more into detail of it later but uh we just finished uh, doing the heritage cup ball hockey tournament with the isbhs uh and then we have uh, one of our pillar events called hockey night in beijing that's in the works right now and then we have some ambassador tournaments and, and then u6 tournaments uh that's being planned leading up to the Olympics because the content is right now highly in demand, but there's just not enough people, not enough companies promoting it because people are so focused on the competition of it that uh, a lot less people are focused on the fan experience and growing the actual game itself and growing the fan base and following. So, yeah, so we spent a lot of time working with our clients and our partners and promotional material, planning events, getting them involved with our events, you know, and then also something that I may not talk as much uh, about on here, but developing a lot of technical stuff too in terms of technology and, and the processes that are used in, in developing the kids uh, of tomorrow in the hockey community. That's awesome. I, I you know, I've always wondered, you know, and, and, you know, think deeply about the barriers for a sport like hockey to be able to grow. How have you seen the rise in hockey's popularity in China maybe over the past decade or so? First five years of the, of the last decade, um, the growth of it has been, there wasn't anything significant. Um, the expat community grew, that's for sure, which I think is one of the, you know, one of the things that grew the popularity in, uh, in hockey. So the expat community kept growing. And so the international hockey community, adults and their kids started gaining interest. But what really, really gave it that huge push and in interest was the 2022 Olympics being granted to Beijing in 2015. So that was the biggest, that was the biggest push. Everybody all of a sudden started looking into what is ice hockey. And that was also the same year that the first Chinese born hockey player was drafted in the NHL, a guy called Song Andong, and he was drafted by the New York Islanders. And so all of a sudden, there was nothing about ice hockey. And then all of a sudden, you have the Winter Olympics, and then you have the NHL drafting a Chinese player. Uh, and so people started to be curious and to look into it. And, you know, and mm -hmm. and, and it, it was a spike. It was a huge spike in interest and, and players and, you know, and kids joining. But since then, that spike has come down a little bit, you know, and hopefully what we're doing here and what the Olympics is going to do for the industry is to allow it to steadily grow as we go along. 
Well, and it's no surprise that it, to me, at least, that he was drafted by the Islanders because I think the Islanders, maybe you know, outside of the Canucks or something, you know, have a really strong presence in China because I know from my trip to Harbin for the uh, 2008 2009 uh, kind of a, a New Year's Eve uh, and being up there. There were kids walking around with all kinds of Islanders swag and apparel all over the place. So Charles Wong, the late Charles Wong, um, he, um, he, he, I think he's from, he's from Shanghai, um, but he, you know, yeah, so he immigrated to the States a long time ago when he was very young. Um, but he's always, you know, in touch with his roots and, and, Basically, he uh, when he bought a stake in the uh, New York Islanders, um, he wanted to give something back, and so he started uh, some, he started something called Project Hope, and um, and he started bringing hockey uh, over to to China. And Harbin, obviously, at that time, being you know the the hockey capital of China, um, where everybody you know that they don't play hockey. They've seen it because there's ice there um, for a large part of the winter. And, um, and he started, uh, he started refurbishing ice rinks, building ice rinks, um, donating equipment, um, training, tra- like donating uh, training programs to the, to the kids. And, and, and this was all just charity. Like I, I don't remember ever even seeing any marketing or promotion about that. He, he, he it wasn't even for the publicity or anything like that. It was just we're giving back the community. And this is what was so great about Charles and the Islanders. Um, and, and it was, it was just, it was just, uh, you know, like when I, when I first learned about it, I, it was just such an amazing thing to, to, to see that, that, that the Islanders were doing that. Um, and yeah. And, and that program um, brought a bunch of kids over to, um, to the Islanders, uh, to the to the Islanders practice rink every year in the summer for a summer camp, and I think uh, don't quote me on this, but I think the the, the kid that was drafted, Misha uh, Somandon, might have been a product of that one of, of one of those summer programs. Yeah, that might, that would make sense. And you were talking about maybe the spike. Um, and how it had spiked. So it was, it was, it was growing in popularity at an increasing rate. And it's probably still growing in popularity, but per- perhaps at a decreasing rate. And, um, part of me wants to point to infrastructure because one of the barriers, you know, it's not like, let's call, you know, soccer or uh, Europeans call, you know, football. Anybody can play anywhere in the world, at least at some point of the year. Anybody can play. You just something round and you go out and you can play soccer, right? You can kick it around. So, yeah, it's the world's most popular sport, but it's also the world's easiest sport that's available to the largest percent of the global population. Hockey does not have that. There are there are some some serious infrastructure impediments to that kind of growth, and I think um, and and maybe don't quote me on this, uh, or maybe I'm wrong. I mean, but is it potentially the case that the infrastructure hasn't grown as fast as the popularity? Therefore, it was bound to kind of hit a bit of a ceiling as far as how fast the pop the sport could grow. Yeah, that, that is one of the biggest obstacles for ice hockey. Um, that barrier of entry is so high, right? Uh, you know, one a kid, uh, if a kid wants to play hockey, um, it's a huge investment, and it's not just a one-time investment; it's an annual investment because uh, kids grow. So equipment, equipment is not made locally here, uh, or they may be made locally here, but they're not uh, widely available locally here because they're all foreign brands. So. Uh, price is high, um, and every year they grow, so they're going to have to uh, switch up. Um, and, and, and we're still in a culture here of if I'm going to buy something for my kids, I'm going to buy new. Um, and so, you know, that's a, a, a ten thousand RMB, two thousand dollar investment every year or every eighteen months um, for your kids right there. Um, and then the availability of ice um, has been pretty scarce, uh, and you know it's 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 growing. But uh, it takes time, and it still takes, um, as you said, the infrastructure uh, to be to be built out here. I was going to say, I mean, there's there's an, there's a physical infrastructure, uh, but there's also a programming and coaching infrastructure as well. 
Yeah, and, and so that's the other thing. And so as r- ranks are being built by people, um, you know, by investors and, and, and companies, um, but when they when they build their ranks, um, everybody they, they need they need to think of the, how do they make the money back. So they start their own hockey clubs, uh, their youth clubs, and you know, and so that 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 actually doesn't really contribute to growing the uh, the game because you know clubs are very closed gate like they're very closed door right they, everybody wants their club to win and um and so you know people are very selective of who they play and 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 who gets to play at their rink and you know and so it 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 sure it helps grow the game and that it adds an additional 50 to 100 players every uh, you know, at, 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 in, in that location, but to develop the interest and to develop the um, infrastructure, it doesn't add to it because um, it's it's so competitive. It's so competitive that you know they want to win. That that you know they, 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 they there's a hesitation in playing other teams until they know or think believe that they can win. Um, you know, and so this is and this is why you know like. Can life? We 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 promote the competition, but we uh, focus more on the the fun, uh, and we focus more on the friendship um, and the uh, you know the fan experience and the uh, and the culture. You know, I guess that's the word that I'm looking for is the the hockey culture uh, that you know growing up in Canada that we have, that we have experienced and. Um, you know, just that, that locker room culture, that outside of, you know, outside of a arena culture um, and win or lose, it, you know, we have a good time. How well does that integrate into the overarching culture of young people and what their parents want for them in, in the Chinese culture? Time will tell, you know, it's if, if one kid has fun and the other ones are serious and, you know, that one kid is probably going to adopt that serious culture. Right. You know, the idea really is to give everybody that experience. You know, it's going to take time to develop and it's going to take time um, to do it. And, you know, I think we, we strongly believe that that when you get to experience fun, that's something you, just, you don't forget. All right. You don't forget because, you know, that that overly competitive culture is in, in, in the truth is, is not just in hockey, but in, in, you know, you'll see it here in the schooling, the school system as well, too. That competition level is traumatizing. It develops their competitive edge, you know, as an adult, whether they go into the workforce or in business, but at the same time, it takes that fun personality out of them. And so, you know, so the idea is we're not just educating kids in the culture, we're educating parents as well, too. I'd love to talk a little bit more about the Heritage Cup uh, ball hockey tournament that we did did last weekend uh, over the long weekend. You know, we had the competition um, and it was great because there were, I'd, I'd say, at least 50 parents and their kids that came out and they got to experience like such a fun weekend hockey tournament where there was so much competition. You know, there was a lot. I mean, there was a lot of chirping going on uh, between <laughs> <laughs> between the teams. And, you know, what is it? What does it mean when you say there was a bunch of chirping going on? Chirping is just, you know, banter between teams, you know, um, it, it's just fun bantering. Oh, yeah, you. it's ribbing, right? It's, you know, yeah, yeah we're giving each other a hard time. We're giving each other a hard lot time. In, in sports, yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, uh, you know, that's just hockey talk. That's just, you know, benches yelling at each other, telling each other they're, you know, they're not, they're not supposed to do something or they're... Uh, you know, tell them to go home, telling each other to go home. Game's over already, anyways. You know, with a five goal lead or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, my grandpa called. He wants his teeth back. Yeah, um, <laughs> and <laughs> things like that. Right? There you good, go. Good hockey chirps. Yeah, there. yeah, exactly. So, I mean, that's that sounds awesome because I used to play hockey growing up. Uh, you did too, and you know, one of my favorite, most fun 
memories is going to those hockey tournaments you know even down in like i remember a hockey tournament in couch and valley or in coquitlam and you know all over the place it just like so fun teams all over the place everybody's in their jackets and jerseys and you know eating at all the restaurants like you know how often have i eaten at a denny's um during a hockey tournament in certain small towns oh, I mean, yeah. it's the best is the best right it's so fun. It's so fun. Yeah. And so these kids got a taste of that. Um, but you know, in a, in a ball hockey form. Uh, so yeah. I mean, it, it, were they on inline skates or was this just sneakers? Was this just road hockey? Um, so this is uh ball hockey, like a, like street hockey. Um, and so we were, uh, we did this, uh, we did this, uh, in partnership with the ISBHF. So the International Street and Ball Hockey Federation. Um, and so the, the ISBHF, they have an annual world championship. So there's, there's such thing as a pro ball hockey, um, the pro ball hockey tournament uh, nowadays. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think at our age, you know, we grew up where, where ball hockey was something that you'd play with a tennis ball on a street. Um so, you know, so over the last 20 years, 20 something years, apparently, um, this became a professional sport. <laughs> um, and yeah, for those who couldn't skate or had access to ice. For those who didn't skate, exactly. Um, and, and it's funny because there was a lot of, uh, a, a, lot of a lot of hockey players actually go to ball hockey because it's, it's actually quite a fun sport and, and, and being from Vancouver, um, I don't know if you know this, but, uh, Alex Burroughs was like an ambassador for ball hockey. He, he was like a ball hockey champion. So he would play on the Canucks. And then in the summer he joined the pro ball hockey team and playing world championship. Like the guy was, a uh, the guy was, was a stud and an, on and off the ice. Did not know that. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, he was well. He and he was a great ambassador for hockey in general. I thought. Yeah, he's he's just a great ball hockey or just a hockey in general ambassador, right? Uh, um, so yeah, he he he's huge in the in the ball hockey world, um, which is very uh, very nice to know. Um, but uh, you know, so so the reason why we did the Heritage Cup ball hockey tournament was to uh, was to showcase the sport to show to show. China, that there is a sport called ball hockey, which is similar to ice hockey because, you know, the rules are, the, the rules are similar, if not the same, um, except you're not on skates and the barrier of entry is minimal, right? It's a stick and a ball, right? A stick and a ball in some dry land anywhere, right? And so, you know, living in China, everybody lives in apartment built, like, but downstairs, there's always a courtyard, you know, where you can just you know, bring your stick down and a ball, uh, and a couple of friends and you can, you know, tap the ball around. Um, you know, and, you know, I, I remember we used to, uh, use two t-shirts or two jackets and lay them on the ground and use them as nets. Right. We don't even, you know, and, and to me that, that feels even more accessible than, than soccer or basketball because with soccer, um, you know, you, you have you, to score, you got to kick it into somewhere and, you know, it's, uh, you know, unless you're just kicking it to the wall and practicing, right? With hockey, you know, you can set up rules where no shooting, you know, just drag the ball across the goal line or, or, you know, different things that we can do. And, you know, in the, you know, in the play area, it can be any size you want. And uh, there's no limit to it. It's just one-on-one or two-on-two or, um, or whatever it is, you know. And with basketball, you have to have a net set up somewhere at a certain height. And, you know, it, so I think like street hockey is such a great sport um, that, where kids can actually learn how to hold a stick, how to stick handle, um, you know, and how to do all, all, all the hockey techniques before they have to learn how to skate, right? Because that investment in a first pair of skates means you're buying the rest of the equipment, um, which, you know, you don't have to do it unless you know you like it. You just have fun um, down in the courtyard with your, with your friends. Yeah, the mentality, the strategy, uh, some of the rules, the, uh, you know, uh, the the goal of the game, but then, you know, really just uh, enjoying the fun uh, and being able to get that uh, at any, almost any season, really. And uh, it, it was such a big part. Any Canadian will tell you, you know, if somebody yells car, yeah. every single Canadian knows exactly 
exactly what that means. And yeah. most listeners probably are going, what are you talking about <laughs> when you're pretending to yell car? And every Canadian go, street hockey, playing in the street. Someone yells car. People grab the nets and you walk to the side of the road and let the car go through. And then it's game on and it's just go time. Just wherever the ball was, you just somebody puts it down and then everybody starts going after it again. And that was just awesome. Yeah, exactly. And it brings back memories when you when you just said, when you just start yell car that way. <laughs> I know, right? But you know, and so, but China's um, getting behind hockey um, it, to a larger degree uh, than uh, some other sports, at least from what we're understanding. Why has an emphasis been placed on hockey? Well, I think the. The first thing was uh, the Olympics, right? So hockey being the, you know, the the, the showcase sport um, in the Olympics made made the you know made China really really focus on hockey and developing the sport, and, you know, and then also hockey is a, you know, hockey is also a um, is is. Is, a, is the next kind of um, fan sport experience that you know that that China has, has had not gotten into, um, you know that uh, that they can get into, um, you know first there was soccer and then there was basketball, um, you know and then you know American football is not something I don't think it's something that um, can really adapt to this culture here yet, um, baseball. Uh, yeah, um, and so hockey is that next sport because it's it's just I think it's just um, um, you know it, it, it takes it, it takes investment to grow a sport, um, and hockey being such an invest uh, such a, a heavy investment for parents and kids um, kind of gave reason for a lot of investors saying that okay if we build it then the people that will get involved will at least have the money to kind of support um, this sport, and so it's it's. You know, and 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 it and, and the Olympics was the big uh, was the big catalyst there. It was a big catalyst there. Um, and uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, like there was this huge spike, um, and it's come down a bit now. It's steadily growing. And I, I've been through uh, in my career. Um, I've done two other things before I got into hockey, and um, I've seen similar spikes in. Um, you know, in, in, in those industries, uh, and then you see it come down a bit, and then it steadily grows, and it and then after it's laid its foundations, and then you can see it flourishing eventually. You know, and so is China gonna China gonna have a team? China's gonna have a team in the Winter Olympics. Yeah. Yes. Wow. China's gonna have a team. Yeah. That's amazing. Do you do you get automatic entries the host country? So the host country, starting with the last Olympics, uh, have got an automatic entry. Um, so Korea got the uh, the one uh, the one uh, three years ago. Previously, and, yeah, yeah, and then China is getting getting one this year, or sorry, uh, next year. I think it's an interesting strategy for China, really, because if you look at a lot of the sports, and if China says, "Listen, how do we how do we jump the line?" And become, you know, somewhat of a competitive threat in a particular sport. You know, American football, that doesn't matter. That's only in America. Baseball, uh, again, more North American. And then you start looking at, well, basketball. I don't know. We're already on our way. We're doing well there. Soccer. I don't know, to try to be competitive with, with all the other countries. I mean, we're, you know, sitting in dozens and dozens down the line. But hockey, where it does take an investment, but China does have that capital. They do have that wealth. And they can, I think, with uh, in, in a shorter amount of time, jump uh, into at least top 20 pretty quickly. Yeah, I mean, if they do things right, um, you know, and, and again, it takes time, right? Like, uh, I think the 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 the, uh, the the time it takes to develop a pro player is fourteen years, right? And so, um, having just started um, five years ago, uh, you know, we'll, I think we'll slowly start seeing better players uh, coming out of the system, um, and as more investment comes in, as well, too. Um, you'll see, uh, you know, clubs starting to do better and, you know, and you'll see the associations trying to like, like picking up things from overseas. And I think they'll learn a lot during the Olympics, 
watching the other teams play and, um, you know, meeting the other, uh, you know, meeting the other uh, organizations, um, you know, from other countries, uh, the, the hockey organizations, you know, and as also as foreign brands start coming in and, um, and, and, and so like just to kind of jump back a little bit to, uh, what I, with the last, uh, uh, pre prior to hockey, uh, I spent 10 years, uh, working in film and, you know, back in 2009, it was a very similar thing when Hollywood was trying to come into, uh, to China and all like movie, this of the sudden interest. And it was a huge spike. All of these Hollywood companies started coming in. Um, and my role was really to facilitate, facilitate between the difference between China and U.S. So working with the local companies, local investments, local uh, production teams, and then um, and then dealing with the Hollywood, uh, the Hollywood teams and Hollywood investments and companies coming in and um, bridging that gap um, because you know there, there's such a gap in between the way they do things, the way the investment works, and everything like that. And um, but at that time there was just so much money being thrown around. Um, and, you know, and, 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 and so the interest level just, again, like spiked like crazy, you know, but then when it came down to actual operations and, um, and, and, uh, and execution of it, it was just a disaster, right? It was just a disaster. And then all of a sudden that spike came right down. There was, we had a, there was a, a, a two year drought before, the companies locally here realize, okay, we have to do things this way properly and uh, figure out our structure. And, you know, it took like, it took, it took five, five years plus uh, before, um, you know, the local China infrastructure um, became solid enough to create their, their own, you know, high level, um, you know, films and, um, and production teams and production companies. Um, so altogether, it was a 10 year process for that to become, you know, such a, um, you know, such a, a, a high quality um, industry, right? And so I don't see, I don't see, like, and, 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 and then the 10 years before that, I was involved in the capital markets, you know, companies getting listed. So I was doing the Chinese companies, helping Chinese companies list overseas and, uh, you know, on the NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange, you know, and so it, it, that was also a 10 year process for that to, to become, um, you know, the way it is today as well, too. So, you know, so I don't see hockey as being anything different. It's it's a new industry, you know, new people, new processes, foreign companies coming in. They don't know anything about here, and people here don't know anything about the foreign um, the foreign uh, way the foreign way of operating that industry. And so, it's about you know spending you know spending five to ten years just working together, making mistakes, um, you know, failing, succeeding, failing again, and and then creating their own system that's adapted to the international. Uh, way of operating, but creating it uh, for the local market. I have to ask then, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering how competitive the China team is going to be at the Olympics because uh, I know China and they don't like to get uh, embarrassed uh, in any respect whatsoever culturally. Yet I can't think of uh, any um, Chinese born player that is in the NHL. So I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that, uh, they are driving, uh, maybe even behind the scenes, got a team, they've got their players. They kind of have an idea of, of who they want there. And, uh, I'm curious if you know what's going on to put that team together and, you know, how are they practicing 18 times a week or, you know, what, what's actually happening there? Uh, they have a team, um, you know, they have a team, uh, they, you know, I think the original plan, uh, the, uh, there, there was a Chinese team. There is a Chinese team in the continental hockey league, the KHL. Um, um, but those, but those guys are not going to be playing in the Olympics anymore because some of these guys were, uh, you know, they were, they're, they're, they're Chinese heritage. Um, and they were similar to what the Korean hockey team does. They were going to get a neutralized citizenship and, um, you know, play in the, uh, you know, play, play in the Olympics. Um, but they have to spend a certain number of days and, uh, you know, working in the, uh, sort of playing in, in China. Um, uh, but since the pandemic, they've been outside and they haven't been able to get back in, um, you know, so they've been their home base in Russia now. And so, so all the Chinese guys are all the guys in the, 
uh, you know, some of the guys did play in the BHL or their KHL team or their farm farm league BHL, um, and some of them played in the local tournaments, local competitions, and um, so there are guys around. Um, they're not a they're not a terrible team, you know. But you know, what my concern really isn't about how good they are or how bad they are. Um, my concern, really, from the from the men's side at least is that they are in the worst possible group uh, ever. Um, because in any team, whether it be China or, or, or any team, um, being grouped uh, in the group A category, uh, which is, uh, I'll start with the, I'll start with what I, in my opinion, um, the, the worst of the three is Germany. But, you know, Germany's got some pretty good players on there and they won the last Olympics and, um, you know, and, and they got, you know, now they got guys like Leon Dreisaitl on, on, on the team um, from the NHL. And then you got USA, which is a, you know, a crazy roster. If, you know, if, if anybody, any of the listeners are following the NHL, they know they got tons of great uh, players on there. And then the number one team on there is Team Canada, um, which I'm not even going to go into that because, you know, so being grouped in with these guys, it's 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 a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, that's not a uh, that's a it's a it's a tough road to climb, uh, tough hill to climb for them for sure. Yeah. That's a tough group. You know, on the women's side, uh, well, for women's hockey, how's that looking for them? Uh, I think the women's. Um, uh, I don't know if the grouping for the. I don't think the grouping is set for 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 um, for the China women's side yet. Uh, I think they're still they're still qualifying. Um, uh, however, the women's team actually is doing pretty good. Um, they've done pretty well internationally. Um, and, and the women's team has historically uh, been a higher ranking team than the men's team. Um, and so I think they, they, they stand a much better chance. I can't say that how well they're going to do, but I, I feel that they're, they're going to do um, a little better in the standings um, uh, versus the men. Uh, just because, I mean, just, you know, just based on the fact that the men's are grouped in the worst group ever to be in uh, as a uh, as an underdog team. Yeah, for sure. Well, that's unfortunate for the men, but you know who who knows? Great great opportunity for maybe the women's team uh, and the women's players to kind of lead the charge and uh, help drive the sport. And speaking of driving the sport, uh, let's talk a little bit about the NHL, the league, the brand. What is their involvement? What is their view uh, on China growing the sport in China? What is their uh, you know activity and investment level in um, participating in, in growing the sport there? Well, the NHL, um, you know, the NHL being the primary you know league uh, in, in in the sport um, that gets all the attention is um, you know in my opinion they should be the ones that are that are driving um, the hockey, the industry here uh, in China. Um, they, you know, in the last few years, they had put on a couple uh, exhibition games uh, called the China Games. Um, and, and so those, those were fun. Um, those were fun because for us Canadians, uh, being here in China, going to an NHL game, it's, it's just an amazing, you know, just the, the idea of that is amazing. Um, you know, but you know, the thing is they, they haven't, they haven't put much money into the market outside of the games themselves. You know, they, they've had a, they set up a couple of uh, training programs, um, here and there. Uh, and then, you know, they partnered up with one of the clubs, um, and, you know, for a year, I believe before the pandemic, um, they had a, 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 a kid's team called the junior Kings, um, and you know, a few guys, uh, like, so the NHL, they sent a, a coaching team over to coach the, uh, the kids, um, you know, and, you know, but, but in terms of overall promotion, um, uh, they, they haven't done too much, uh, you know, they haven't done too much from, you know, not just my observation, just in general. Um, and so I think that they are, um, you know, I believe that they are looking for ways to come into the China market uh, and looking for the right partners. Um, and, you know, the, the biggest issue is, I mean, what's the biggest issue? Well, I think the best thing for, for an organization like the NHL to do 
is to partner up with the right brands and the right companies that are eager to promote the sport, um, you know, and, and, and work with them in doing it rather than partnering up with uh, clubs or um, specific, um, you know, specific uh, hockey rinks, right? Because, you know, again, I don't want to get too much into the politics of it, but again, clubs are very inward focused um, and not outward focused and having partnerships with specific clubs and rinks um, keeps that brand isolated to a certain area in the industry. Right. And, you know, and I think one of the things that, um, you know, the NBA and, 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 and also soccer, uh, you know, the soccer leagues have, have done so well is that they've found the right partners and they found the right brands to promote the sport and which has allowed them to, um, which has allowed them to, to grow um, and to the size that it is right now. So, you know, I think, I think the NHL has a lot of work to do. Um, I think there's an opportunity for them to, uh, to get in here for like to get in here full time uh, because the Olympics with the players coming, there's a huge opportunity for them to, to just, capture the opportunity of that traction with all their players being here, all their players being on TV all day, every day um, for a full month period, you know, so we're going to have to see, we're going to have to see what they're going to do. Let's bring this to a close with a bit of a fun question. Are there popular hockey players in China who are the most famous, the most sought after jerseys? What are the names on the back? Yeah. Um, I would say, uh, so during the China games, uh, or during and uh, in between the China games, the, the few players did come to China to visit. Um, one very specific one was uh, uh, Ovechkin. So Obi was here, and so he's got he's gained a lot of popularity, and also being a star um, and having won the cup that year. Um, that he came, um, he gained a bit of popularity. Um, but then there's also, you know, guys like uh, David Pasternak. Um, the Boston Bruins has a, had a partnership here in, in China. Um, the, uh, the 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 group that invested into the NHL um, is a huge Bruins fan, so did a lot of promotion for the Bruins, and you know, Pasta being um, one of their main guys, uh, got a lot there. Um, and then you got guys like Patrick Kane, who's, you know, who's a smaller guy, but really good at stick handling and just, just a really good player. Um, Having a great skilled. year. Yeah. Um, you know, so a lot of the kids here who play hockey relate to him um, and want to be him on the ice. And so he's got a lot of, he's got a lot of traction. And, you know, and Crosby, um, you know, before the winter, before the China game started coming, Crosby was always one of the most recognized players. Um, among the kids. Kevin, thanks very much for coming on the show. I really appreciate your time and I and, uh, can't thank you enough. No, thanks for having me on the show, Todd. Growing a company is hard. Doing it in a foreign market? Exponentially so. The best piece of advice I can give you is not to do it alone. When you start looking across the pond for further expansion possibilities, and I sincerely hope that you do, make sure you choose the right partners to do it with. My good friends at WPIC Marketing and Technologies have almost 20 years of experience helping brands just like yours enter China. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Negotiation. And if you're interested in being a guest or want to connect with me or any of our team, please reach out to us at podcast at WPIC.co. And be sure to rate, comment, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Zai Jian.